This morning, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit of inside baseball of the church. Things that, you know, get talked about at, at, at places where we're talking about, about church and what's happening with the church. So, it's probably no mystery that, you know, the church is going through changes. Every church is going through changes. We're looking at, well, how did the church function in the past? What's going to happen in the future? Those kinds of things. So one thought is, uh, I'm going to throw these, these words out at you, and then we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about our lesson uh, from Acts, and then we're going to come back to it. So the words are believe, behave, and belong. Okay, pretty easy mnemonic, all Bs. Believe, behave, belong. So some people consider, well, that's kind of how the church works. You know, you've got people who learn in society, or they learn as children about God, about other beliefs of the church, and then they come together. So we get a bunch of believers together. You know, and we as uh, people in a, in a mainline church, we, we even confess our beliefs every Sunday morning. There's going to come a time where we're, this morning, are going to confess and say the Apostles' Creed. So as believers, we come together. And as believers, we also try to, although we are all sinners, we also try to behave a little bit like believers. And then we come together in this community to belong. So believe, behave, belong. That was historically how the church kind of worked. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about what Paul's doing, and then we're going to come back to these three words and see maybe could, what happens if we change the order. Okay. So let's go to Paul. So we have this story of Paul in front of the Areopagus. Now, because I am afraid that if I keep saying Areopagus throughout this sermon, that that word will change and be funnier and funnier as time goes on. So I'm going to use the word Mars Hill because that's where the Areopagus was. Okay. So Paul is going to Mars Hill, and he's going to have this speech with these uh, people who spend their day thinking about things, arguing with each other, doing philosophy. Yeah, these are people who are no longer, or maybe never were, you know, laborers. These are people who have the leisure time because, you know, they have uh, an empire, not an empire, but they have their, their own companies of employees or slaves or something, so they got plenty of time on their hands. So they are pursuing this knowledge. So, Paul goes out and gives a brilliant speech. Now, and he reasons with the people, and they say, oh, Paul, you've done a brilliant speech. This is good stuff. Now, we as Christians, especially certain, there's a certain kind of Christian, there's a certain kind of Christian that says, oh man, if we could only, if we could only give a good reason, a good rational explanation, then people would follow us and believe. And that is a dream. Oh, let me tell you, it is a dream. Um, it is something that many Christians, many people who go to seminary, just, you know, they look at this example that we're going to talk about in Paul and go, oh, if only we could make that happen, you know. I mean, I know Christians like that. I see one every morning when I look in the mirror. Such a, a dream to like, oh, if we can only make a great argument, things are going to work out great. So let's talk about this argument that Paul does. So Paul goes in front of these people, and he connects with them first. He says, you people are all very religious. I can see it. You're so religious that you even have an altar to an unknown God. You're covering your basis. 
And what I want to tell you here is I know that unknown God. I know that unknown God, and I can share this with you so that you can now start worshiping the one who made these altars and made everything rather than the end result. And as Ron pointed out this morning, people responded to this. They responded. They said, yes, this is a great idea, um, and we will consider this and follow Jesus. You know, it sounds like a great conversion story, and probably there was some great conversions. But if we just look at this episode of Paul, we don't see the big picture of what Paul was doing. Okay, So a little bit about Paul. We see him in Acts, but we also learn about Paul in his various letters. So we get a picture of Paul, and when typically on Sunday morning we're reading about you know, this is Paul's letter to the Corinthians or the Ephesians. He's responding to a situation. We don't get a big picture of what Paul was doing. Now, I once, I read this book uh, by someone who was just studying religions as they went through time. And he wasn't necessarily a Christian. But he pointed out that Paul was the best entrepreneur for Christianity because Paul would do whatever it took whatever it took. We see Paul forming communities when he could not speak and reason with people. He worked in the community. He spent time making tents. He did all sorts of things to make the kingdom of God be the end result. Paul was an entrepreneur. He was able to be flexible and promote community, and also reason with people. So here we see in Acts his grand explanation and his way to win over a crowd, and he won over that crowd by focusing on something that they had in common because they were all religious. They were all looking for some truth, and Paul found that and used that to expand on. So this story at Mars Hill kind of reminds me of, of a little bit of the challenges that we sometimes hear in modern Christianity and science. So some people think that there's, you know, there's, there's some sort of animosity between the two, but I want to tell a couple short stories about two gentlemen who uh, really say that science and faith, they really go together. Um, one of them is a, is a physicist named John Pokinghorn, who is both, well, he, he died recently, but he was both an Episcopal priest and a physicist. And he found that the more he studied physics, the more important God became, because there were some things in physics can't explain, can't explain. And he would reach out to his faith to find answers. Uh, the other person is Francis Collins. Now, Francis Collins was recently retired from the head of the National Institutes of Health, medical doctor. And Francis Collins, and he's done all sorts of things. He was the head of the, uh, uh, the Genome Project. So Francis Collins did all sorts of things in science, but his faith journey started this way. He was a medical doctor, and... He was sitting by the bedside of a patient who was dying of heart disease and tried all the medical things that they could do. And they got, you know, Francis Collins and this patient be became friends, and, and the patient was sharing her faith with Francis Collins as a doctor because he was doing research and spending time with this woman. And the woman asked him once toward the end, well, what do you believe? Well, this created a little bit of crisis with Francis Collins because he did not know. He did not know. He thought he knew, but he never spent time doing that. And it was there that his faith journey began. And it continues to this day. And Francis Collins will proclaim that when he does research, it's like worshiping God because he's seeing what God can do in this world and he is just inside that creation. Because, you see... 
God is everywhere. God is everywhere. And faith can come from anywhere. Faith can come from anywhere. So let's go back to Paul for a moment, and let's talk about what Paul did not do. So Paul's going to Mars Hill, and he sees all these people, and they're doing worship, and they're worshiping idols. So what Paul could have done is he could have went and said, you all are violating the first commandment. You all are worshiping idols. Well, how would that have gone over? Probably not too well, because people wouldn't have understood what Paul was so mad about. So Paul took a common point and used that to grow their understanding. So we still have believe, behave, belong. Now, I'm going to ask a question. What would happen if we changed that order? If we changed that order and we said that on someone's faith journey to add new people to the church, the first thing we're going to be concerned with is belong. We're not going to worry so much about first about if you believe. We're not going to worry about how you're behaving because we think this community is so great, so amazing, so beautiful that if only more people would belong to this community, they would see what we believe. If only more people would belong to this, they would start to change their behavior to something that would be constructive to them and their community. If only people would belong, the rest would follow. Would behave follow? Would uh, believe? I don't know. But maybe if we start with belong and make that the cornerstone, maybe, maybe people will follow along. Now, I'm going to leave you with two stories um, that relate to this. So, first story is mine. Uh, this was, happened when I was probably ooh, 25 or so. I had just moved to, to Phoenix from Wisconsin. I had been out of college, I was starting a master's program, and, you know, I was kind of, I would go to church once in a while, but I didn't really find anything that, that really compelled me. So I ended up at this place, I think, because my home church sent me a list and it's like, these are the places you can go to in Phoenix. So I went to one. I mean, it was an okay service. It was all good. But then I remember Kelly, and somebody I still know to this day, um, said, you know, I hope you come back next week. Weird thing was, I believed him, and I came back, and community grew. Another story, and this is the one I'll, I'll close with. Um, so a good part, uh, I've done ministry in juvenile detention for many years. So uh, for those who, who don't know or haven't experienced prison or juvenile detention ministry, um, at the standpoint of evangelism, it's one of the easiest ministries to do. It really is. There are people at the end of their hope in prison. And when you come in and provide some hope, they respond. Not everyone responds, but they respond. So we would go in and do like a, a three-day event, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we'd have some of the kids come. And then after that, we would have uh, Saturdays for about an hour where the kids would come back and we, we'd have some talks and sing some songs. Now, the three-day event's very popular because the kids get out of their, their units, they get, some, they get better food than they normally get, they get snacks, they get to be kids for a little while. It's very exciting for them. So it's easy to get kids to come to the three-day. Not always as easy to get them to come back on the Saturday because sometimes they've got something else to do. Maybe they've got some recreation or they've got, you know, uh, or they just, some just kind of fade away. But we asked them to come back on Saturdays. So I had this one young lady, tough kid, really tough exterior, you know. I think uh, T was what she went by. But she was one of those people who was not afraid to let you know her opinion. And I really appreciate it. Because 
She would sometimes say, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I believe. I don't think I believe this stuff. And my response back to T was, I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're here today. And I hope you come back next week. And I hope you come back next week. And she came back next week. But next week, she also told me, I'm not sure I believe this. And she kept doing that for a little while. And eventually, if I remember correctly, she quit saying, I'm not sure I believe this, and just came back. Now, I don't know what happened to her. We only get them for a little while. But that's an example of belong, I think, in a small way. Amen.